Welcome to the CEC Report for the 21st of April 2017. I'm Elisa Barwick and joining me today is CEC leader Craig Isherwood. Welcome Craig. Yeah, thanks Elisa. And on today's show, Australia's most dangerous ally unmasked as provocateur for world war and only Glass-Steagall can pull our banks into line and defuse the housing bubble. So firstly, Australia's most dangerous ally unmasked as provocateur for world war. So we're talking about Britain to most people's shock here, Alisa, Yes, which is... um, Malcolm Fraser famously referred to uh, America and Britain as our dangerous allies. Yes. And some people may think Trump is the leading figure in the latest uh, war provocations, surprisingly enough, based on what he had promised during his election campaign. Uh, but as we'll show, it's actually being directed as was the Iraq war and other similar regime change operations straight from London. Mm. Um, and basically what we saw in the recent period is this chemical weapons attack in Syria in Cain Shakun on the 4th of April and also the rhetoric that is increasing and building on North Korea and on Iran uh, do reveal that uh, even though you can have a president coming in with certain intentions, there is what people refer to as a deep state apparatus, uh, military industrial complex, a permanent war machine basically uh, that is run top down out of London, which have gotten a certain grip because this is a new administration, um, very raw. You've got a lot of people that have not been chosen from the ranks of the regular Republican Party. And so they're trying to forge something which is quite difficult. And of course, tra Trump's been under merciless attacks from the media, attacks as being almost a Russian agent, basically. Uh, some of his appointees are under the sway of the permanent war apparatus. So it's not really that surprising that this is going on. But what I want to start with today is a short video showing exactly what the stakes are in this fight. This is Helga Zeppler-Rusch, the head of the Schiller Institute, speaking at their recent conference on the 13th to 14th April in New York. What happened is de facto a coup d'etat inside the United States, which has two elements. One is the false flag operation in Syria, combined with what one could call a palace coup inside the administration. Now, this coup is a British intelligence operation and it must be recognized as such in order to liberate President Trump from this great danger. Remember that the American War of Independence, <coughs> that which created the United States, was made against the British Empire and the British Empire never gave up the idea to reconquer the United States. The first time they did that was in the War of 1812. Then the British Empire allied with the Confederacy. British banks financed the Confederacy uh, in this war through their affiliates in Boston, in Philadelphia, and so forth. The British Empire totally uh, got upset when Trump announced that he wants to go back to the American system of economy. Alexander Hamilton, Henry Clay, Lincoln. Henry Clay believed in what he called the American system. You just should reread what Henry C. Carey wrote about the difference of the British Empire economy, which makes people poor, and the American system of economy, which is concerned about the well being of the labor force, raising the living standard. We need people to become conscious again about the American history. So here you can see from what Helga is saying, you know, the British are desperate to stop the US-Russia collaboration. That's yeah. really what's behind the scene here. And Elisa, we cover a lot of this material in our alert service publication, Australian alert service publication, every week. And people might find it shocking still that they can't believe that Britain would be behind this, that it's, mm. a, it's a dumb headed giant, the United States, mm. that's really causing all these problems. That's not true, but people need to educate themselves and that's why we suggest that they call in and get a free copy of the alert service yeah and see what's actually behind the scenes Yeah, going read on. the actual details, you know, we don't just say Absolutely. this without the um, evidence behind yes. it. And actually, just to flesh that out a little bit, a number of Russian representatives over the last week or two have identified this ongoing war party that continues to run, regardless of the change of presidents, 
um, but also identifying the role coming out of London. And this was kind of, uh, you know, the Russians have not always identified Britain as a key element. But, uh, of course, when Trump came in, it was really obvious that he wanted to have this good relationship with Russia. And something intervened obviously to sabotage that and it was really obvious if you you know follow politics where that was coming from so i want to show another video clip here and this is the russian un representative vladimir safronkov blasting the british representative of the united nations matthew rycroft uh, rycroft had just presented a resolution calling for an investigation into this chemical weapons attack in syria in terms that essentially blamed the Syrian government for it in advance. Um, so we'll just roll that clip. Uh, Mr. De Mistura, you cannot flag in your efforts. You must continue uh, in your work with the Syrian delegations, uh, actively urging them to dialogue and to finding common denominators. But the statement of the representative of uh, the Great Britain, Mr. Reichardt, uh, showed that the only thing he's thinking of is uh, to complicate your efforts, Mr. de Mistura, to uh, prevent the political process from unfolding, to bring into the Security Council a confrontational uh, uh, attitude. Uh, uh, and the, sub the essence is, and everyone in the UN knows this very well, that you are afraid, you have been losing sleep uh, over the fact that we might be working together with the United States, cooperating with the United States. That is what you fear. You're doing everything to make sure that this kind of cooperation be undermined. This is precisely why. You look at me when I'm speaking. Don't don't look away. Why are you why are you looking away? This is precisely why you today didn't say anything about the political process. You didn't even listen to Mr. de Mistura's briefing on purpose. You make uh, you make insulting demands, uh, the guarantor of the Astana process. Well, what have you done for a ceasefire to advance the ceasefire? You 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 welcome various opposition groups in London and Paris, uh, illegal armed groups. You, you, you suddenly were afraid that uh, things seemed to be moving towards peace and a political solution. Basically, you support the interests of armed groups. Many of them have been murdering Christians and other uh, minorities in the Middle East. They have been, uh, they've been committing uh, terrorist acts in uh, uh, churches on Palm, on Palm Sunday. That's who you are, uh, whose interests you are advancing. You, what are you doing? So, basically, it turns out that regime change for you is more important than the positions of the majority of uh, the member states of the United Nations. Well, Alisa, I think you can see how the uh, Russian United Nations representative there nailed mm. the British mm -hmm. in a very calm and deliberative way. And I think also it might be stunning for people, and most people don't know, they never met, never heard, never read, uh, about Bashar al-Assad, the mm -hmm. president of Syria. And in this particular, this week's uh, alert service, we cover an interview that he did with the uh, agency, uh, France Press yeah. Agency. They conducted an interview with him on the, um, on the 13th of uh, April. And what's stunning is just how calm, how precise Bashar al-Assad mm. is about the fact that this, uh, the fact is that the US has been working, continues to work with the terrorists Mm -hmm. against the interests of what you know of defeating international terrorism and you find from talking to him or looking and reading his material you actually get a sense of what the truth is the matter mm -hmm. relating to Syria and, and he, I think people should really get a copy of yeah. this and read about it because he even identified too what we were just talking about this permanent apparatus in Washington so he wasn't that surprised at the shift that Trump made because he knows and others know very clearly what's at stake. Yeah. Um, but this Rycroft who he was taking on in that video, um, he was actually the private secretary to Tony Blair at the time of the Iraq war. Mr. And regime change. Tony yeah, Blair. exactly. Mm. And he wrote one of the infamous memos, the Downing Street memo in 2002, which basically showed how they could set up uh, Saddam 
to require or to um, bring about an intervention to go to war there and have regime change. And that's come up again now. Um, Boris Johnson, the Foreign Secretary of the United Kingdom, has raised the fact that there should be a joint Anglo-American action to remove um, Bashar al-Assad. Um, he basically, you know, a stunning comment, he said, look, you know, um, Assad has recaptured, had recaptured Aleppo, he was gaining ground, he'd almost won back uh, most of Syria with the help of Russia and with Iran, um, and the West was basically on the verge of a consensus that, well, we'll have to leave Assad in power and, you know, maybe there'll be a more drawn out political solution. Uh, and he said, but then came the attack of Khan Sheikhoun. So he basically admitted, you know, well, now regime change is back on the table because of this chemical weapons attack, which brings into, you know, real question who was actually behind this attack. Because it clearly was not Assad when he was winning on the ground, and we'll talk about that more in a moment. Mm. Um, but uh, the effect of this, because remember, Assad is fighting ISIS. That's what he's doing there. Um, Ex-NATO General Harold Kujat said that if Assad were to leave now and be ousted, the Syrian army will collapse and there will no longer be ground forces that can defeat ISIS. So, but there is hope and the Tillerson visit, the Secretary of State Rex Tillerson was in Moscow. They set up a working group to begin to resolve the issues between the US and Russia. Uh, and that was actually quite positive, contrary to what the media said. But we'll take a quick break and we'll keep talking about this in a moment. Welcome back to the CEC report where we're discussing the real provocateurs uh, behind the drive for war. It's not actually, you know, these leaders like Assad or even the North Korean leader. Um, you know, the North Korea biggest issue there was that they've seen what's happened to Iraq and Libya and when they saw that regime change despite them letting weapons inspectors and so forth into their country and, you know, complying, um, they were blown to smithereens and sent back to the Stone Age with American and British bombs. So, yeah, um, what, what, what the North Koreans have seen is that those states that haven't developed their nuclear weapons capacity are literally destroyed through regime change. And they're saying, well, we're not going to go down that track. Mm. We're going to try and defend ourselves. Mm. And what's important about North Korea, and I think it's because it's topical at the moment, is that back in the 90s there was real pro project, uh, progress made by the Clinton administration, you know, where there was going to be a suspension of nuclear uh, work on nuclear weapons and so forth for exchange for food programs, for all sorts of development uh, initiatives by the Clinton administration. But when George Bush came in and mm. Dick Cheney, they unilaterally canned that in 2001, just yeah. wiped it off. So at least we've had nothing but 16 years of provocations from the West towards North Korea, which is leading more and more towards a, an accidental breakout of war at the mm. worst possible scenario. And the other, things that the, the other thing that the Russians also raised regarding these chemical weapons, supposed chemical weapons attacks in Syria, uh, is that the organisation that's meant to be investigating it now, the Organisation for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons um, Use, is headed, both of the working groups that they've set up are both headed by officials from the United Kingdom. Um, you know, so they've questioned why that would be the case if it's supposed to be an impartial investigation and they didn't even want to send people onto the ground in an area that's completely rebel controlled mm. either. So they're not even serious uh, about it. And think about that in the context of what the uh, Russian UN ambassador said to the British. You know, look at the attitude of the British. Yeah, yeah. And now I want to say that whilst the government here in Australia and the opposition leapt immediately to blame Syrian President Assad for all of this, um, several prominent Australian military and intelligence experts did cast doubt on the official story. Uh, Major General Jim Molan, who was Chief of Operations in Iraq in 2004 to 5, he said it was done at a time in the war when Assad and his supporters were doing quite well. There is no logic to it and why didn't they just drop half a dozen explosive bombs for better impact if that's what they wanted. Um, Andrew Wilkie, the independent MP, who was, of course, an army intelligence officer and in the Office of National Assessments and resigned over the Iraq invasion, he said um, uh, Australia should have learned, given we have been stuck in the Middle East quagmire since 2003, again on account of allegations of chemical and biological and nuclear weapons, and we should invite, await the results of an investigation. And uh, he also said it's an unlikely choice of weapon. Um, for these Syrians to use. Uh, and you had the former UN weapons inspector and defence intelligence organisation technologist Rod Barton. 
Uh, he identified the bomb crater where supposedly this weapon hit. Um, he said it looks like it is from a small rocket that could only carry a couple of litres of uh, chemical gas, far less than what would be required given the number of casualties that uh, were reported. And we can put up a, an image of that crater, which has also been analysed by Dr Theodore Postel. He's from uh, he's a professor from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology and he's a weapons expert for many decades uh, and he has extensively written uh, the fact that this could not possibly have been a chemical weapons attack by the Assad government and that basically it's a fake and you can read about that too in this edition of the Australian Alert Service where we've reviewed his extensive article on that. Um, but Craig, you know, this is about splitting Russia and the United States. Why is that so important to stop them co cooperating? Well, because as other presidents have said in the past, if there's ever a chance of Russia and the United States collaborating, you, you're going to see a complete change in the, the way that things have been operating since the post-World War II period. Look, have a look at what's happening with the BRICS countries, Brazil, Russia, India, China and South Africa. Have a look at what China is doing around the One Belt, One Road initiative around the world, the enthusiasm, the optimism that comes from large-scale infrastructure development projects. It's a new paradigm. In other words, it completely changes things. The War Party, the out of the City of London, out of the British Crown, they want to maintain this control, this international control of uh, sovereign governments, trying to smash them to bring them under their control. And that's what's at stake mm. here. Their financial system is actually crumbling. It's yeah. falling apart and they want to maintain as much control as they possibly can in the face of these real strong pushes and necessary pushes for sovereignty. Mm. And when you see the, di the political dynamic that's developing with what we saw with Brexit, the Italian referendum being overturned, uh, the election of Trump, you've got elections coming up in Germany and France, uh, the UK have just called an election this week and of course you have the prospect of Jeremy Corbyn um, who's the leader of the opposition there and who's pro glass Steagall, who wants a national investment bank to build up the economy of Britain. Um, you know, this is a great threat to, you know, this system that exists today and the financial system which goes along with it. And we'll have a quick break, but right after we're going to come back to that financial system and in particular what's happening in Australia at the moment. <laughs> Welcome back to the CEC Report. Only Glass-Steagall can pull our banks into line and defuse the housing bubble. Now, you know, the biggest contributor really to our housing bubble, which is completely out of control, um, is the fact that we have banks that are completely addicted to speculation. And so they use um, the housing market and the speculative price rises to build and spin money effectively uh, to be able to keep their bad habit of derivatives gambling going as we've talked about many times on the show. Now there's been a few warnings just over the last week or so. The Reserve Bank of Australia um, in their financial stability review pointed exactly to a bubble without using the B word um, but they exactly you know, outlined what a bubble is. Um, they highlighted the fact that 23% of own, owner-occupier loans are interest-only mortgages and 64% of investor loans are interest-only and the implications of what happens when they have to start repaying principal. Uh, one third of borrowers, they also highlighted, have no buffer or a buffer of less than one month of repayment. So this is also a big issue. Uh, then you had Martin North from Digital Finance Analytic and he told Fairfax, I have a feeling <clears throat> we are meandering our way, perhaps a little bit blindly, into a rather similar scenario to the US subprime mortgage crisis. Mm. You had warnings from Fitch, Standard & Poor's and Moody's uh, to the AFR Banking and Wealth Summit earlier this month and Chris Richardson, who's Director of Deloitte Australia, the accounting firm, pointed out that many people's houses now technically make more money in a day than they do because of the appreciation in the value. And he said that's kind of God's way of saying this thing's going to blow. 
Um, so, Craig, the only way to stop this speculative binge is Glass-Steagall. Can you explain what that is? Well, Glass-Steagall is part of the re-regulation <coughs> of the banking system, but the most important part, Elisa, where you separate out the legitimate, necessary commercial banking operations of ordinary banks, what we call the boring banking business, you know, mortgages, uh, housing loans, deposits and so forth. That's separated out from the other part of these banks that have become invest invest investment banks or merchant banks, insurance companies, stockbroking houses, so they become enormous, they become very, very big. On a global scale, they're referred to as too big to fail. In, in Australia, we have four of these too big to fail banks, which you know, the big four, and the idea is to separate out that speculative activity. Uh, and Australian banks are absolutely engorging themselves on these instruments called derivatives, which never used to exist prior to 1990 in any, any significant way whatsoever. But since the deregulation of the banking system, the banks have been allow, able to put, of course, their corporate profits ahead of any other interests whatsoever. So what they've done is they've been uh, loaning enormous amounts of money into the, the housing market. You know, 60% of the bank's assets yeah. are loans and mortgages into this sector. We have an overinflated housing bubble by every metric you want to imagine. Uh, I mean, just here in Melbourne, the median house price has gone up over 800000 for the first time, which is basically double what it was 10 years ago. Mm. And you know, this is unheard of. Mm. Uh, but it's a bubble, and that's the point. So Glass-Steagall is the first part of re-regulating the banking system so that you actually have a strong regulated banking system where people's deposits are protected and not allowed to be used by the banks for their speculative purposes. Mm. I think that's really the key. And there's been a number of breakthroughs in the United States, which is very good news around Glass-Steagall in the last period. Uh, Glass-Steagall, which is already tabled as legislation to you know, revive this uh, legislation in the House of the US Congress, has now also been tabled in the Senate, and that was done by Democratic Senator Senators Elizabeth Warren and Maria Cantwell. Independent Angus King and Republican John McCain and another Democrat added her support the next day. There was also a meeting where Gary Cohn, who is the chair of Trump's National Economic Council and he's a former president of Goldman Sachs, told the Senate Banking Committee that both he and Trump supported the idea of bank separation in a Glass-Steagall framework. Uh, you had US Senator Maria Cantwell She's lobbying for Glass-Steagall, even calling up the media and so forth, and she's issued a mass petition campaign to collect signatures from the population for the bill. Um, there are a number of other petitions also running, and there's been some excellent coverage where even the London Financial Times said that Britain's ring-fencing ring rules could just be a prelude to a full-blown UK version of Glass-Steagall. The New Yorker said it's entirely possible now that the administration would propitiate the gods of public opinion by restoring Glass-Steagall. And Roll Call, which is a magazine up on Capitol Hill in Washington, uh, said that Glass-Steagall can become one of the top legislative items in Congress overnight if Trump officials make their support for it clear and public. Also, Treasury Secretary Steve Mnuchin just supported um, or re-expressed re his support and Trump's support for a 21st century version of Glass-Steagall. So there's motion. We need to get it to in Australia. And that's right, Elise. I mean, because this we are still in the grips of a you know, expanding global financial crisis. It has never solved from, you know, what's it, eight years ago now? And that's the point, is that if we don't move and re-regulate the system now, getting control of the financial system through Glass-Steagall, we can risk moving into a completely uncontrolled uh, breakdown of the system, which will be an absolute nightmare for everyone on the face of the planet. And that is what's actually on the cards right, right. now. Um, and in fact, a lot of the war drive and so forth is in reaction to the fact that the financial purse strings, which currently is the control mechanism from the Anglo-American Centre of Power, are unravelling. So be sure to contact us, give us a call to get the latest literature and join into the CEC report again next week. Mm -hmm.